if we could just stay in the posture of worship for a little bit, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say that the children are dismissed for Children's Church. So if you have children, they can leave for that. I have a brother, a good friend of mine, who just wondered if the church could pray, and he is willing to stand in the gap for. He's willing to stand in the gap for his father, who's being oppressed by the devil. What's happening is not of God. What is happening is not of God. The mind games, the oppression. And so Marcus, I'm going to ask you to come. And he said he would like to stand in the gap for his father, and he'd like the church to pray. And I believe we should do that. There was a time when Peter was in prison, and the church prayed, and the prison doors swung open. And so whoever's up here, the elders, let's, Marcus is going to stand in the gap. If you would raise your hands, we're going to pray and honor this request. God, I thank you for my brother. I thank you for one who recognize that there's, recognizes that there is a great physician. And I thank you, God, for Marcus. He says, I'll stand in the gap for my family. I'll stand in the gap for my father. And right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, we, we, your word says that you have given the church the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so we, uh, we just call out uh, God right now to John. And we pray, Father, that you would, in the name of Jesus Christ, let him be loosed from this oppression. Let his mind think and the ways of the Lord. Let him have revelation and understanding of who you are, O oh God, the great physician. We just pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ. According to your word, we bind the vices of the devil and we cast them into outer darkness where they came from and let John walk in freedom the rest of his days. Father, may there be a testimony that comes out of this that would just uh, ignite family and friends around him and say that there is a God who's bigger than any religion. There's a God who's bigger than any organization. There's a God who's bigger than any doctor. There's a God who's bigger than any medication. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, we speak freedom and we command you, devil, to release him of his oppression in the name of Jesus Christ. And may he go from mourning to dancing. May May he go from graves in the gardens, oh God. And may he just live his life in the fullness. And may he have life and have it more abundant. In the name of Jesus Christ, we stand in the gap and we thank you, God, that you honor our prayers, you honor our cries. We thank you, oh God, that we don't have to have a, a, a prescripted prayer. We don't have to have a recipe. We just come to you, God, and say, God, he's yours. He's yours, and you would not have that any would perish in the name of of Jesus Christ, we speak freedom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to lift up our sister Barb yet as well. She won her prayer. She's having surgery this week. Barb, just come up here. I know, guys, chicken's going to get cold. It's all right. We've had cold chicken before. Barb is, Barb is, uh, she's dealing with uh, a mind game right now. She's going to have surgery this week. There's some fear involved here, not of, of the unknowing, but she's going to have surgery and we're going to trust God. We're going to trust God for the best. And so Brother John Hooley is going to pray for her. Heavenly Father, we just call on your name because that's above everything. Above the surgeons, above Barb's mind, above her anxieties that have tried attacked her right now. We just call peace right out of heaven. Lord Jesus, you purchase it with your blood and we apply it to Barbara. We apply your peace. We talk to the surgeons. We say, have your way and do it perfectly in Jesus' name. Set this woman free and let her walk in divine health and healing in Jesus' name. Let the power of the Holy Spirit just invoke her body right now in the name of Christ. Be it so done. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your participation. I'm going to ask you to be seated. And um, Brother Mike had a word for this church, and I, I believe it has something to do with the sermon today and with the message that 
God laid on my heart. So I'm just going to ask my brother Mike to come up and share with the church the word that he feels like the Lord laid on his heart. Uh, that was scripture in Peter that says, God was manifested in the flesh, declared righteous in the spirit, seen of angels, preached among the Gentiles, and received on up into glory. That's the God we serve. There are some who feel like they're not worthy. Although they are born again, they know God loves them. I'm talking about right here in this church. They know God loves them, but they feel unworthy. God has called you. God has given you giftings. First of all, he saved you. And he's called you and he's given you giftings. And you know, that used to be a mystery once upon a time, but it's not a mystery anymore. Here's the mystery that's been revealed to some that feel that way. Is Christ in you the hope of glory? So if you got Christ in you this morning, the hope of glory, then you are worthy. You are worthy because he is worthy. And he swore by no greater than himself. And we've sung a bunch of songs here this morning. A lot of things have been said concerning his greatness. God is great. And there's none greater than him. There's no circumstance. There's no situation. There's nothing that may come up in our lives that's greater than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So you're part of the body. You're part of the body, and the body needs you. If you hear this morning, the body needs you. So you're worthy. So my prayer is that you get delivered and set free because it's a lie. It's a lie. God has made you worthy, church. He's made you worthy in himself. So that's something to rejoice in. That's something to, 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 to that's where your faith lies at. That's that's, that's, praise God. There's no fear. And you never need to feel like there's nothing that you can do with him in Christ. Thank you, Brother Mike. I'm just going to invite the Holy Spirit now to um, just guide my words. Spirit of God, I just come to you this morning. I give up this vessel, this tongue. God, I, I don't desire anything but you. And so I just pray that you would speak to every heart and soul that is in here this morning. Father, I ask for a touch of heaven even now, God. Lord, we don't want to be the same. We want to walk out changed today. And, and we just give it all to you, God. May you speak through us, uh, to us through your scripture. And we just praise you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, worship team. They left already. I... Uh, I'm going to try this with a handheld microphone because I, I have a Bible and I'm not sure how close I can stay here to this podium. I usually cut a rug down there, but I'm going to try this and I'm just going to give you the title of my message and it's not going to make sense to anyone. Maybe, maybe 1% of you is going to, it's going to make sense, but the title of this message is uh, Send It to the Breakers. Send it to the breakers, and, and it's, it's a mystery, and the reason I do that is I'll give you the title of the message, uh, send it to the breakers, you're not quite sure what it means, and so you will not leave to eat chicken until I tell you, right? So you're going to have to hang around for just a little bit, but this message uh, starts, I'm going to start in Luke chapter 5 is where my message starts, and Sometimes to get the whole picture, I'm going to be using the Gospels this morning, at least three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And sometimes to get the, full, get the whole picture of what's happening, you have to read all four Gospels. And so to get to where we're, we're at in Luke chapter 5, we almost have to walk backward a little bit, uh, starting in John, right? So it's John, Luke, Mark, and Matthew. But, but here's what happens, and this is, uh, uh, on, in my Bible, I just write, wrote down this, Jesus picks his church. 
what I realized was when Jesus, when he went to get his disciples, when he, when he, he started his ministry coming up from the Sea of God, uh, from after being baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist, and, and John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he, and he baptized Jesus Christ. And the following day, now this is in, in John, I believe it's in chapter 2. But the following day, uh, here comes uh, Jesus walking again. And, and John has a few disciples with him uh, at that time in their name. Uh, one of them's Andrew, and, and, and it's Peter's brother. Peter's brother, Andrew. And, G, and John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew and, and I believe it's either, either Philip or Nathaniel, is, is with John. They're disciples of John. But he says, here's, here's the Lamb who's taken away the sin of the world. This is the Messiah. And, and, and they leave John the Baptist, and they follow Jesus Christ. And then Andrew introduces his brother Peter, and he says, hey, we found the Messiah. We found the Christ. And so Andrew, Andrew introduces Peter to Jesus Christ. And here's where we pick it up in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, it says this, and this is, we're going to start in the beginning. We're going to read some scripture today. I, I have this watch, so I won't go over time. I, I got introduced to this watch by my brother Amos Yoder. It's a running GPS watch, but the thing lies all the time. Like, I don't even know if I can believe it or not. I put in my weight and height and everything like that because you start, I started my running program, and, and it, it, I looked at my weight and height, and it goes, you're obese, I'm going, I hope you don't talk to a woman like that. She would take the hammer to that watch, never to be seen again. Maybe that's what it meant. I'm a beast, not obese. Okay, so that's what it was. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And so I don't believe the watch anymore, except for how many miles I go. So anyway, this is in Luke chapter 5, verse 1. It was when the multitude pressed him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Genesaret. And he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, that's Peter, and asked him to push out a little bit from the land, and he sat down and he taught from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, if we understand right, Peter had a boat. Peter had a boat, and there was a time in Peter's life where he bought this boat, and that thing had a maiden voyage. His boat went out for the first time, and Peter started fishing for a living. And I was just thinking this morning, if I read Scripture correctly, Peter was not all that great of a fisherman without the help of Jesus. I mean, he, it looked like he never caught fish. He said, I fished all night. I didn't catch any fish. That's what he would say. But anyway... Jesus stopped speaking and said to Simon, he said, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let, it, let down the net. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come help them. So there's two boats out there. They came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. And Peter realized there was something happening here that was not natural. See, he had been introduced. Andrew had said, look, I met the Messiah. I've met the Christ. And he introduced him to him. But I, I, I believe that Peter wasn't quite sure yet. And this is when Peter realized that he saw it. He fell down at Jesus' knees and saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Peter, with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, he said, listen, Peter, do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and they followed him. And so, and so Jesus Christ said to Peter, said, listen, you're done fishing for a living. Peter had a boat. I don't know what happened to that boat for a while. Peter left all that he had, and he followed Jesus Christ. You see, you see, Jesus started picking his church, and I, I started looking at all the disciples that Jesus picked. And he went to, to, the, to I guess you could say almost, uh, it was almost like the scum of the town is who he went to to pick his church. 
He did not pick one Pharisee. He did not pick one religious leader. Jesus said, if I'm picking my church, I want those who have no self-righteousness. I want those who do not have their own righteousness because I want them to have mine. I want those who have been, who have been downcast and outcast. I want those who have toiled and, and labored all night and have not caught any fish. I want those who, have not, who are not going to come with any preconceived mind, mindsets. I don't want them. I want a church who is after me, who is after my righteousness because I can't use self-righteousness. And Jesus started picking his church. And he wanted somebody who was teachable. You see, we have to be teachable if we're going to follow Jesus Christ. Norman Barnes, I don't know how many of you have, met, uh, have, have ever heard Norman Barnes or met Norman Barnes, but when I first started coming here to River of Life, I think it was probably at least five years ago I heard him speak for the first time and the only time he was here at church, and I have never seen or heard of him again. But Norman Barnes said this. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it. He said, to get where you're going, you have to embrace where you're at. To get where you're going, you have to embrace where you're at. You see, you see, many of us feel like we've been called by Jesus Christ. Many of us feel like we've been called by the Savior. We've been called out into ministry. But there's some things, sometimes we get stuck on our past. Jesus doesn't care about your past. He cares about where you're going. He doesn't care about the junk that you used to live. And he didn't care that Peter, I don't know what all Peter was involved with. If you watch The Chosen, you start thinking a little bit different. But, but Peter was one of the downcast men of the city. And, but God didn't care. Jesus didn't care. He said, I need, I need somebody who's going to take my righteousness because Jesus already knew then. He was picking his church. I hope you heard the word that Brother John Miller spoke this morning. We recognize gifts here in the church. Listen, I, some of you are going, this is not normal church. We don't want normal church. I'm just, I'm just going to shoot straight with you. I am tired of organized church. We, we, see, we see church happening in the streets of Chicago and in the streets of Cleveland. We see church happening in Tampa Bay where, where the government will come and say, you can't do it, so we're just going to praise God out in the streets. You can't have this part. We're just going to praise God. There's church happening out here in the parking lot. People are, are getting saved and healed. There's church happening in here, but it's not normal. We're not on, I'm just going to tell you right now, if, if once you get hungry at 12 o'clock, I'm hoping to be done by then. If your stomach starts growling, it's normal here. I'm serious. You can ask Pastor Gordy. I don't think his stomach growls ever, but he, some people do. I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm going to get into trouble here. So, so when Gordy was preaching the last couple Sundays, I went over to get my children over at Children's Church, and, and I asked Joel. And Heidi, I said, are you halfway through next week's lesson yet? So just so you know, they're doing what they can, and, and bless them for doing what they do. So, so this was Jesus, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go through some of the Gospels because I really want to get to the story that, um, to, to the Scripture that really brought me to this place, uh, to this message sent to the breakers, send it to the breakers. And so uh, just hang with me here. We're going to get to it. I'm going to go to Matthew. Matthew, and, and we heard some of this this morning. This is in Matthew chapter 16. And this is where Jesus confirms that his disciples, the ones that he picked, the ones that he wanted to follow him, these are the men that are going to start his church. We hear the word, uh, the word church. Uh, Jesus used the word church three times in the New Testament. Here was one of them. Here was one of them. This is in uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of, region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. That means uh, Simon, the son of Jonah. His dad's name was Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. You are, and these are these Greek words is Petros. You are, you are Petros, and on this Petra I will build my church. 
You know, we can take that scripture and we can say, well, was he really talking about Peter? Was he really, was he pointing to something else? But I, I'm, I'm just going to take it literal and say, Jesus pointed at Peter and he said, you, Peter, I choose you and on this rock I will build my church. I'm going to kill somebody with that thing. And he says also this, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against my church. But I'm telling you, church, we have to stop playing games. We have to stop playing games. What we do now in organized churches, we, we, what we want to do is draw people in. We want to draw people into church because there's bills to pay. But man, I, I think sometimes I believe that church is getting done out on the streets because people are not coming with preconceived mindsets. People are not coming with what they think that uh, that church should be like. I talked with a, I talked with a man here a while back. Uh, he was a guy that I I had met before, and he asked me he asked me about church and about ministry, and he said I need to start going to church somewhere. That's what he told me. I invited him, and he said he went to a church one time. It was a big, nice building. And he said, and, and they were adding on an, a, a million dollar addition to this building, local church. And here's what he told me. He said, they're asking me for my money. He said, but I need my money. They're telling me that I give to the, that if I give to the church, I'll get a hundredfold back. He said, actually, I just want the 10% to, um, to provide for my family now. What we do is we try to talk people into giving to our system. What we need is people who are passionate about the things of God. What we need is a church who is turned on fire for the things of God. And if we keep playing systematic church, we're going we're gonna, to uh, keep walking without power. Some of this stuff may be a little harsh. What needs to happen is the church needs to get back to its God-given authority. If we actually believe that what Jesus Christ told Peter, he said, on this rock I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it, do we actually believe that? He said, whatever, whatever, Peter, whatever the church binds on earth is going to be bound in heaven. Whatever you church, whatever you loose on earth is going to be loosed in heaven. It's time that we come back to our God-given authority because here's what's going to happen. And this, and John Bevere said this, he said, if you do not use your God-given authority, it's going to be given to somebody else. It's going to be given to the one who has ten talents, who took the ten talents and made ten more. You can take your talent, you can hide it. What's going to happen is you, God is going to take that talent, he's going to give it to the one who has ten. Why, God, are you giving to the one who already has a lot? Because he's using it. We have to come back and use our God-given authority. And take back, you see, it says, uh, I'm not even sure where in Scripture it says, it says that the kingdom of God is going to suffer violence. The violent take it by force. Church, I'm not telling you we need, to, we need to fight physically, but we need to get violent in the spirit. We need to take back what the devil has stolen from us. We need to take back what the devil is doing in this day. And we're going to get to that here in just a bit because something happened to the church that Jesus Christ had called So I thought about calling this message returning to our passion or finding our passion. How many of you know uh, the definition of passion? Passion is this. Passion is an emotion that you can barely control. An emotion that you can barely control. And if I would ask you, I could ask each and every one of you, what is your passion? And probably about 10 years ago, somebody would have said, Jerry, what is your passion? I would have said hunting and fishing. I don't want to hear that. What is your passion? I want to hear what your passion is in, in, in the kingdom of God. You see, I believe that every disciple of Jesus Christ, I believe that every member sitting in church today should have a passion for the things of God. There is some stuff in our life that we can just barely control anymore. There is an emotion that is uncontrollable. 
And I talked with my brother Bob Smith today, and I, and I thought of, when I thought of passion, I thought of Destiny Rescue. And yesterday, there was some stuff going on in Shipchuana. There was a, a benefit chicken and, and, and uh, potatoes and rib drive. And Bob told me this morning, he said that because of the passion of a few ladies who have an emotion that they can barely control, because of this passion, five kids will be rescued from the, select, uh, from the sex trade. I call that passion. I call that passion. I, I call that an emotion that is hard to control. There's many of you in here that have an emotion that you can barely contain. There are some of you whose passion will take them to the streets of Chicago to minister to those who are fallen and downcast. There are some of you who have a passion that you just can't contain when people are broken and you say, I need somebody to disciple. But I'm telling you, church, I'm telling you right now, some of us in here need to find our passion. Some of us in here need to come back to our passion. Some of us has, have left our passion because we think the devil's winning. He's not. Just looks like it. It's time that the passion of the church gets louder than the voice of darkness. What is your passion? I look at the passion of Jesus Christ. What was the passion of Jesus Christ? What was his passion? The passion of Jesus Christ. In my own words, there's, there's a lot of different ways you could say this, but was restoring a fallen humanity to a loving, merciful, forgiving Father. His passion, that was his passion. And, and there's a reason that he said, when I go, the Holy Spirit is going to come because I'm going to hand my passion to you. I'm going to hand my passion to the church of Christ. And everything that we do for the kingdom of God should point to one thing. It should point to one thing, and that is to restore fallen humanity to a loving, merciful Father. Whether it be preaching, whether it be pastoring, whether it be prophecy, whether it be evangelism, whether it be leading in worship, I, I asked a few people, I said, what's your passion? I, I asked my wife, I said, I know what your passion is, but I want you to tell me. And she said, it's worship. And I, I, I can tell you right now, there's an emotion inside of her that she just cannot control, whether it be in the house or whether it be up here. And that is worshiping God. There's some of us that have a passion to, to just walk alongside people and disciple people. And, and I'm just wondering, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. I'm not going to put you on the spot. But if I looked at each and every one of you and I said, what is your passion for the kingdom of God? Would you have an answer for me? Does your passion supersede your love of sports or hobby or whatever it may be? Does your passion for the kingdom supersede? Let me, let me just say this. Your passion is not necessarily something that you love. Now, please understand me. You can love your passion. I love my passion. But it's not necessarily always something that you love Look at Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Look at what the passion of Jesus Christ did. I wrote something down. I wrote it on a card. This is, this is not really a poem, but it's something that I wrote down, and I'm going to read it to you. This is the passion of Christ. The passion of Christ drove out demons and became friends with prostitutes. It raised the dead and it opened blind eyes. It shouted down a Pharisee and it wept for a friend. It stilled the storms, and it drove him to the tombs. The passion of Christ fed the multitudes, but it fasted for millions. The passion of Christ defeated the flesh and brought life to the spirit. The passion of Christ begged with the Father, but sent him to the cross. Listen to this scripture in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus came, this is Matthew chapter 26 and verse, uh, and verse 36. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter. He took with him the church. He took with him the rock. He said, you're going to be the church. There's some stuff, church, that you're going to have to learn. The reason that I called you to walk with me for three years is because I'm going to leave this earth and you're going to have my passion. And you're going to have to learn some stuff took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which were James and John. 
And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. And he said, stay here and watch with me. And he went a little bit further. He fell on his face and he prayed, oh, my father, God, if, it, if there's any way out of this, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And he says this, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You see, the passion of Jesus Christ wasn't necessarily something that he wanted to do. But it was something inside of him that he couldn't contain. It was an emotion inside of him that he could control no more. The passion of Jesus Christ drove him to the cross because he knew one thing, that if he didn't do it, you and I would not be restored to a merciful, loving father. And his passion drove him to the cross. Your passion may not be something that you just love doing, but it's something that you can't not do. Your passion is something that you can't not do. Church, you need to find your passion. We need to find our passion. Jesus came back to his disciples. This is in verse 40, and he found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, What? What, church? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, there's a few different uh, meanings of temptation in, in, the, in the New Testament. This temptation means enticed or put to trial. Watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. If I put it into my own words, I'll say this. Church, watch and pray lest you fall into spiritual complacency. Watch and pray lest you're enticed by the devil. Watch and pray lest you're drawn away of your own loss because it leads to sin. And what happens is when the church falls asleep, when they forget to watch and pray, when they start slumbering, they fall into spiritual complacency, and all of a sudden the thing that Jesus has called them to do is not enough anymore. All of a sudden the, the ministry that they felt called to starts dwindling. And it's like the, the train just runs off the track. And what happens is there's nobody there to tell them, get up, get up, wake up. Get back on the tracks. Get back on the train. Let's get this thing rolling again. Because it seems like the devil is winning, but he's not. Jesus goes back to pray a second time. Luke 22, it says that the, the anxiety of Jesus Christ, the passion that drove him to the cross, had him praying so hard that, that great drops of sweat like blood fell from his forehead. The passion of Christ bled in the garden already because he knew what he had to do to restore us to a loving father. I can't, sometimes I can't quite grasp that passion. The human mind sometimes can't quite grasp that passion. Some of you in here have, have gotten a passion for something of God, and it's, it's actually separated you from family. It separates you from family, and it attracts the outcast. How does that work? The world will never understand. The world will never understand. And I, I know last night Dave Shetler said something that I never heard before. He said, if the world understands what we're doing, we're in trouble. Only the spiritual-minded will understand the things of the Spirit. There's a story that a, a friend of mine shared, and when he shared this, I, I had to Google it. I looked it up, and here's the story. In, in the year of 1732 in Germany, and, and I got as many details as I could, but there's a passion here to restore fallen humanity to a loving father that I have not grasped yet. I, I don't quite understand how you do it. But I believe the days are coming where we will. In 1732 in Germany, there was two young men. They were with uh, a, a brethren church. One of them's name was Jonathan Dober, and the other one's name was David Nitschman. They were Mor Moravian brethren, and they got called to ministry to the slaves on the islands of St. Croix and St. Thomas. And 
but the government said, or, or the slave, uh, the, uh, the, the, the government there said, you can't go, we're not going to let you. And so these men knew that they had been called to minister to the slaves on these islands of St. Thomas and St. Croix, knew that there was only one thing to do. And these young men, they go to a slave owner and they said, how much? How much for us? And they sold themselves into slavery. And as they got on that ship, going to these islands of St. Croix and St. Thomas, knowing full well they'll probably never return, these men said this, may the lamb that was slain receive the ward of his suffering as they watched their family grow smaller on shore. I don't understand a pastor like that. But church, if we have a passion, it has to point to one thing, and that is to free the slaves from bondage. That is to preach the gospel to the poor. It is to open the, the, the eyes of the blind. Not, I'm not, not just talking the physically blind, but the minds that have been blinded by the devil. It is to open those blinds. It is to preach the gospel to the poor. It's, it's to heal the sick. It's to raise the dead. Our passion has to point to one thing, and that is to restore a humanity to a loving father. And here was Jesus praying in the garden, wondering if his disciples could stay one hour, watch and pray lest you fall into spiritual complacency. And Jesus got up and he said, my time is at hand. And something happened. As, as, as Jesus got up and he got taken by, by the rioters, by, he got taken by, by this crowd, the disciples followed it, it wasn't just Peter. Scripture says every one of them followed. But they all scattered. They all fled. When they realized that Jesus was going to go to the cross, they all scattered and they all fled. But Peter followed and John followed. And I want to get to, for time's sake, I'm going to get to, uh, going to get to, to the Scripture that I really wanted. Because of, anyway, and to Peter, it seemed like darkness was winning. To, to the disciples, it seemed like darkness was winning. To the disciples, it seemed like the ministry that you've called me out of, you, you called me away from my boat. You called me away from my livelihood, and you said, this is going to be your ministry. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. I don't think Peter quite understood what was going on yet, but dark, the, the, the hour of darkness was here. And his ministry was stripped from him. He didn't know what was going to happen next. He just knew that Jesus was going to the cross and Jesus had lost. That's all that Peter knew. He thought the devil was winning. He thought that darkness was winning. And he thought, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go back to my boat. I'm going to go fishing again. And I'm going to live under the Roman rule. I thought I was serving the king. I thought I was following the king that was going to deliver us from this rule. And, and when Peter started rebuking Jesus Christ, he said, you don't have to go. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to do this. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, church. I have to do it because there's something that my passion, I, I, my emotion cannot contain this anymore. I have to go to the cross so that you can have life. That's what he should have told Peter. I have to go to the cross so that you can be anointed with the Spirit. And here's, we're going to get to send to the breakers. Send to the breakers. John, John chapter 21. And so when all the dust had settled, after a couple days, Jesus Christ rose up out of the grave, the same, the same Spirit that rose him from the, uh, that rose him from the grave um, is in us now. Jesus rose up from the grave, and he, he showed himself to his disciples. He, 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 he showed Thomas, you know, that I'm really back. I really rose up from the dead. But, but Peter saw him a few times. So this is the third time that he showed himself to his disciples. And then something happened there where Peter was going, I don't know what to do next. I don't know what to do next. And he said this, I'm going fishing. I'm just going to go fishing because that's the only thing that he knew without to do other than follow Jesus Christ. 
Chapter 21 of John, it says this, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Where was his boat, is my question. Where was Peter's boat? He left it and followed Jesus. He left his boat, his nets, and everything. He followed Jesus Christ. And this is the first time that I read in the three years that he followed him that he somehow he found his boat again. And that's what happens, church. We think the devil is winning. We think that darkness has taken over. We think that we serve a sleeping Savior. And what we do is we go back to the only thing that we knew before. I'm just going to try to survive and get through life. I'm just going to try to provide for my family and get through life. I'm just going to try to make it to the end. Maybe by the grace of God, I'll fall into heaven. And Peter was out there fishing that night. Verse 4 says, But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet his disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, you have, have you any food? They answered him and said, No. And he said, Cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw in the multitude of fish. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved, this was John, said to Peter, It is the Lord. And Simon heard it, and there was only one thing to do. That was jump out of the boat. Simon jumped out of the boat. And he swam into Jesus Christ. Simon left his boat for the last time. If a boat makes a maiden voyage, if a ship makes a maiden voyage or, or sails for the first time, it is called a maiden voyage. If a boat sails for the last time, guess what? It's sent to the breakers. Church, I want to tell you this morning, it's time to send our boats to the breakers. It is time that the thing that we thought would get us through this life other than Jesus Christ is sent to the breakers. They would take these big ships, they would sail them to a, a certain port, and there they had people that worked, and they would break these ships down, metal and iron and all that. They would break them down, and the ships would sail no more. But there is, I believe, church, we are, we are in the times where it's time that we leave our boat for the last time and trust in the words of Jesus Christ that we have been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven and the gates of hell are not going to prevail. The gates of hell will not overpower us because we are the kingdom of God. We have been given the keys to the kingdom of God. Jesus told some, he told some of the religious leaders, he said, you've been given the keys to the knowledge You've been given keys to the kingdom, but what you do is you basically you hide them from those who want in. You, you keep the ones that want to go into the kingdom. You keep the ones who want to receive knowledge of God. You don't let them go in. And what you do is you put stuff on them. You put rules and religion on them that you cannot set yourself even bear. And you don't lift a finger to help them. He told the Pharisees, he told the religious people, he said, you guys, you travel the country, you travel the whole world, you amass land and sea. You sail, you walk, and you make people look, act, and think like you, and you make them twice the son of hell as yourself. How do you, how do you go into the streets of a big city? How do you go into the streets of Chicago and bring somebody to Jesus Christ and tell them now? You have to follow rules 1 through 10. I don't read it. It says, if you love me, follow me. Jesus, uh, Peter left his boat for the last time. He sent it to the breakers. We never read again that Peter went back to fishing. We never read again that disciples went back to their boat. Because what happened was Jesus restored Peter, and then he put something on him. And I, I just want to read that, yeah. This is in verse 15 of John 21. Jesus had prepared breakfast. And when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And I believe he was talking about the other disciples. You, you love me more than your brothers. 
He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And, and if you want to dissect this, I'm not going to take the time to do it, but two of those feeds are different Greek words. Two of those loves are different Greek words. You have agape love and you have phileo love. And when he said, feed my lamb, feed, uh, feed my sheep, the second time when he said, uh, he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, he said to him, feed my sheep. That's a different Greek word from the first one. Basically, it means you tend to him. You watch my sheep. I'm going to leave. I'm going to give you my passion. The passion that drove me to the cross, I'm now going to put on you. You're going to lead my church. You're going to be the church of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give it to you. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wish. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And then he said this to Peter. He said to him, follow me. Now, why would Peter, when, when he had told, when, when Jesus had told Peter, when he saw him for the first time there by the boats, he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Peter left his boat and his nets and he followed Jesus Christ. There was something physical. There was a physical entity that, that Peter could follow. But here we read in Scripture where Jesus is almost ready to go up and sit at the right hand of the Father. And he says to Peter, he says, follow me. How do you follow Jesus Christ? I believe by following Jesus Christ, you stand on the front lines. And church, we are in a day where we have to stand on the front lines. We are in a day where our passion has to come out. We are in a day where the passion of Jesus Christ has to be everything in our life. Truth will always trump darkness or will always trump um, untruth, obviously. If the worship team could come up, I have a few more scripture, but I want to sing a song. There's stuff in our, there's stuff in our days that we're seeing that our parents never saw. Stuff in our days that we didn't think we would ever see. And there's the, the song that they sang, The Blessing. You have to think of your children. You're going, our children are going to see stuff that we've never seen or we will never see. There's something, here's something that they probably will never see. It's like when I was 16 years old, I had a moped. And, and uh, I could put about 79, 80 cents worth of gas in that thing. And, and the easy thing was if I was going from 75 cents to 80 cents, I could stop it right on 80. Now you're going, you got $32 in there, you want to stop right on 33, you squeeze it a couple more times, you hit $37. You're going, well, that didn't work out. Our kids will probably see stuff that we have never seen. That's why we need to rise up as a church. That's why we need to let our passion flow from us so that our children and our children and their children will see it. But there's a blessing that will come upon these children if we walk under the anointing of the Holy Spirit because they can walk in the same anointing. This passion that the Spirit will put on them will lead them to places you probably don't want your children to go. But if they say the Spirit of God is leading me here, you have to trust. Peter was being restored to Jesus. And Jesus said, he, he told him, he said, follow me. There's one more thing that I want to point out here. Peter was like, why are you just speaking to me, God? Jesus, why are you just pointing me out? And Peter said this, he, he turned around, he, he saw the other disciples whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who portrays you? This was John. Then Peter seeing him, Peter, Peter seeing John, turned around, he said, but you're telling me to follow you, but what about this guy here? What about John? What about the other guys? But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I want to, 
If I will that he remains until I come back, what is that to you? You follow me. It is easy for me to sit in church and go and look around and say, what about John? Why doesn't John have to do that? Why doesn't John have to leave? Why doesn't John have to leave his job and go do this? Why doesn't John, uh, why doesn't he go to the streets of, of, of Cleveland to, to minister? Why doesn't John go to prison and preach like, like Rick does? Why, why, don't, why doesn't he do what I have to do, Jesus? So don't worry about him. I called you to follow me. It's a personal obedience to the call of Jesus Christ. And now we have been given that same anointing. The passion of Jesus Christ has been transferred onto his church. And it's time that we rise up. Remember the words of our brother John Miller this morning. It is time to rise up and let our passion flow. You'll have people that will tell you you're just too passionate. Don't let them ever talk you up. See, the church, the church has let the world talk them out of being the church. That's what has happened nowadays. We've been talked out. You see, for some reason, for some reason, the ones that aren't out rioting and burning stuff down are the crazy ones because we just think weird. We believe in something that we can't grasp. We believe in a book that was written thousands of years ago. For some reason, we're the crazy ones. But why? Why are people drawn to that? Why are people drawn to that? There's testimony that came out of Chicago that I heard this morning of a protester being radically changed and baptized into the kingdom of God. You see, church, we can't make this stuff up. We can always try. We can always try to imitate the work of the Holy Ghost, but there's one thing better that is the imitation of the Holy Spirit, and that is the real thing inside of you. You see, when Jesus told Peter, when he said, you need to follow me, I'm going to transfer the anointing to you, Peter still wasn't sure. They went into hiding up in the upper room, but when that day of Pentecost comes, something came into that room like a mighty rushing wind, and there was a baptism of the Holy Spirit that fell, and immediately Peter got up and he started preaching the gospel gospel and on the very on, on some of the first days thousands were added to the church because the boldness of Jesus Christ was transferred through the spirit to the disciples of Jesus Christ and Peter sent his boat to the breakers and he never went back fishing in that boat again he never went back to the life that he once knew because he knew that I've been anointed with the spirit of God to lead a fallen humanity to restore this fallen world to a loving merciful saving father that spirit is available to each and every one of you. That transfer of passion is available to each and every one of you. And we heard in Revelation this morning, those that believe my word, they're going to overcome. Right, Chris? He will say that over and over to the church. If you believe, you will overcome. So I'm going to ask, we're going to sing a song again. And uh, Gordy is going to, Pastor Gordy is going to have some instruction on, on the food, but I'm going to ask this morning, church, if you, if there's somebody here that wants prayer because you feel like you've walked away from your passion because of circumstance, because of family, because of the, the crazy times we're in, if you feel like you've walked away from your passion, or if you feel like, like you, you thought you had a passion and it got ripped out of your hands, or some of you if you could not stand up and say, this is my passion for the kingdom. And if you really want to discover that, I just want to pray. We just want to pray with you. We have elders, pastors that want to pray with you, brothers and sisters. Because we have to find our passion. And so if you want prayer this morning, we're going to sing a song. I'm going to ask uh, you to come forward. If we want to pray with you. And then uh, Pastor Gordy is going to have some instruction for the food.